When I cross over, I will shout and sing. I will know my Savior by the mark where the nails have been. By the mark where the nails have been. By his side upon his precious skin, his precious skin, I save him when I come to him. By the mark where the nails have been, amen. The riches may claim a crown of jewels, but the king. can be told from the prince of fools by the mark where the nails have been by his side upon his precious skin his precious skin and savior when i come to him by the mark where the nails have been on Calvary's mountain, where they made him suffer so, all my sins was paid for a long, long time ago. Amen. By the mark, by the mark where, where the nails have been, by his side upon his precious skin, his precious skin, my Savior, when I come to him, by the mark where the nails have been, I will know my Savior when I come to him, by the mark where the nails have been. Those of you standing here, let's turn to the New Testament. Turn to First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. Uh, go to chapter 1. First Thessalonians, chapter 1. Okay, this is one of Paul's letters, and he wrote this to the people of, help me out, Thessalonica. Paul wrote letters to seven churches, and then I, I think I mentioned last week or a week before, he, mentioned, uh, he wrote to seven churches and three individuals, three men who were overseers of churches, and he gave a lot of good instruction for them that also applies to me and you. So one thing that, that is interesting is how Paul had a great care for those people that he influenced to either be saved or to live the Christian life. And as I read this today, uh, the message is called the, the Work and Power of the Gospel of Christ. And what Paul's going to say here is what God has been doing. He's going to talk about what God has been doing in the lives of these converts. And I think that we can read it ourselves and see how these are the things that God wants to do in us. So let's read. We'll start in verse 5, and we'll go down to the end of the chapter, verse 10. So 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. As you know, what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what mannering of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. All right, well, let's have a word of prayer here, and we'll get into this message here. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that we have the preserved words of Scripture in front of us, how precious they are to be able to read them and uh, teach and preach 
these things that we read about. And Lord, I pray that you would take control this morning. I don't want to get in the way, and I pray that nobody or nothing gets in the way of your word going forth, being sounded out this morning, and doing a work in our hearts. Uh, we pray that spiritual work is done this morning, both in here and in the back with the children. And we pray again, Lord, that you have your way, and may we all just honestly deal with what you put in front of us, what your Holy Spirit reveals to us. And may we, uh, may we truly come out of here uh, edified and even convicted and exhorted, just whatever the work is that you may want to do. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so one thing that Paul was very concerned about was not only that people get saved, but also that they grow after they get saved. You know, a lot of churches, they are very evangelistic and they are interested in telling people how to get saved and they do a great job of that. And then once people get saved, okay, you're done. They don't ever follow up with them. And you know what you're doing whenever that happens? If, if people do that, you're basically throwing them to the wolves because they need to understand some basic things about the Christian life. They need to understand some things about God's word and they need to, what's the word? Four letter word starts with a G. They need to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, you don't need to answer out loud, but if you're here this morning and you're saved, how much did you grow in the year 2020? Think back. It's almost been 12 months now. We're in the 12th month of the year. Think back to where you were in January, spiritually, and think about where you are now, spiritually. And did you know, we actually read about affliction in this, in this passage. Did you know God... One of his methods for growing us is affliction, hardships, difficulties. You had any this year? If you lived in this country, you've had more than what you were used to, right? And a lot of folks would say it's been really bad. Some would say it hasn't been that bad. Regardless, this has been an abnormal year. And we can sit and look back and say, oh, it's been really hard. And we can complain and moan. Folks, God uses years like this one so that saved people will grow, so that people who are saved will continually rely on the Lord for their basic needs. And we had a lot of uncertainty this year. You know what happens in uncertain times? You either flip out or your faith increases. And what happened with you? Did you flip out? You start worrying? Or did you just have faith, trust God that he would take care of you? Guess what? God took care of you this year. You're here today. Evidence that God took care of you this year. So on this thing about growth, there's a little girl that was memorizing some scripture and uh, her Sunday school class, she was supposed to say the scripture that she had memorized during that week, just kind of like we do with the adults in here. And she knew the verse, but she could not remember the reference. You ever have that problem? You know the verse, but you can't remember the reference, which is, is kind of hard. It's kind of, uh, it doesn't work because you got to be able to find it in the Bible, right? You want to be able to say it, but then if somebody asks where it is, you want to be able to show them. So here's what the little girl did. She's trying to think about where that verse was. And she said, I think it was from the book of reevaluation. It's actually revelation, but she said something very important here. She said, I think it was the book of reevaluation. And she couldn't find her verse because she didn't exactly know where to look for it. But you know, we ought to always read the Bible with the intent of re-evaluating our lives when we read God's Word. Because you know what God's Word is? It's a mirror. And it'll show you what you really are. And every time you come to church and hear God's Word, every time you're at home reading God's Word or studying God's Word, you know what it's an opportunity to do? Re-evaluate where you are with the Lord when it comes to spiritual things and growth. And if the Lord puts some things in front of you that you maybe need to take care of, maybe you need to get rid of some things, maybe there's some things you need to do that you haven't been doing, if the Lord shows you those things, you ought to be honest enough with the Lord to say, I'll do it. When you agree with God, that's when spiritual growth takes place. But see, if you're going to just put your hand up and resist all the time, you're not going to grow. Okay, so this, this uh, kind of got off track here talking about growth, but um, I'll get to some more about that in a minute. I want to first start off here talking about verse 5. And uh, three points here this morning. The first one's from verse 5. Paul said to these people, for our gospel, what's that next word? For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. And I want to really focus on that word that comes after the word gospel. The go our gospel came. And he says it, he actually tells you how it didn't come. It didn't come in word only, but in power and the Holy Ghost. 
And I just want you to think about something. If you're saved this morning, the word of God had to come to you first, didn't it? So this first, mes- uh, first uh, point this morning is coming unto you. And what I mean by coming unto you is that the gospel of Jesus Christ had to come unto you in order for you to be saved first, right? It first had to come unto you. So let's talk about that this morning. Let's talk about the gospel coming unto you. Go to Romans chapter 10. If you're saved here, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved, hopefully you can think about at what point in time the word of God actually came unto you. The gospel of Jesus Christ came unto you. Now there's many different means of God's word or the gospel of Jesus Christ coming unto you. But let's look at how God does this. Look at Romans chapter 10. Look at verse 13. Romans 10, 13. The Bible says, familiar verse should be, for whosoever shall, what's that next word, folks? Shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, all right, you know what's required for salvation, folks, according to that verse? A person to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save them. I'm not going to have you answer out loud, but have you called Was there a time that you can think about in your past where you called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to save you? Okay, if you did that, according to the verse, you're saved. Look at the next verse. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not, what's that next word? Whom they have not heard. And how shall they hear without a, without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring good tidings, uh, glad tidings of good things. Notice in those verses there, it begins with calling upon the Lord. And then the Lord takes you in reverse here. And he says they can't call on somebody if they've not believed on him first. And they can't believe on him unless they first heard about him. And they're not going to hear about him unless there's a preacher to tell them. Now, preachers are not just people that stand, or not just men, I should say, that stand in the pulpit. Did you know that? Did you know that if you're saved, you should be a preacher? Didn't say you should be a pastor of a church. That's reserved for a man that God has called, but everybody's a preacher. Did you know that? Did you know we got some things on the back uh, rack back there, our track rack? We got some little written pieces of paper that are little preachers. Did you know that? Those little things themselves are preachers. And what I'm saying here is that if you're saved, God's made you a preacher. And a preacher is somebody who proclaims God's truth, right? And God's called every person who's saved to do what? Proclaim his truth, all right? So go back there to 1 Thessalonians real quick. And he says, our gospel came unto you. Well, I thought we should talk about, first off, let me, let's look at that for real quick here. 1 Thessalonians 1 here. Our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in what? In power. He says three things. Our gospel came unto you in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance. Okay, you're not going to be able to proclaim God's word in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and with much assurance, unless you yourself are saved. Okay, you are going to be able to do that. You're going to be able to do that. Proclaim it in power, and in the Holy Ghost, with much assurance. If you're saved, if you're not saved, you can't even do that. So salvation is a starting point. God wants you after you get saved to proclaim his word in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Now, notice he says our gospel. I uh, want to make sure before we go any further, let's make sure we all understand what the gospel is. What is the gospel? I don't know if I'd get several different answers or one answer this morning if we went around the room. Let's get the Bible on this, though. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So keep your finger there in 1 Thessalonians. We'll be back. 1 Corinthians 15. Let's make sure we all know what we're supposed to be proclaiming as saved people, what we're supposed to be telling the world. Very basic, but there's a lot of people may not know this. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 3. Actually, look at verse 1, and then we'll go down to verse 3. This is Paul again here, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the what? The gospel which I preached unto you. And then he goes on to say some other things. And in verse 3, he actually tells you the content of the gospel that he preached. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that? Here's the first point. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Here's the second one. And that he was buried. Here goes the third one. 
and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Folks, right there in verses three and four, that is the gospel that Paul preached. That's the gospel you and I are supposed to be preaching. The good news is that, hey, Christ died for your sins. Are you a sinner? Christ died for them. Well, dead people stay in the grave, don't they? Not the Lord Jesus Christ. He was buried, but what happened? He arose, showing that he's no ordinary man. He's God in the flesh. And he offers eternal life and forgiveness of sins for anybody who will first believe that he did that for them. And then, what Romans 10, 13 say? Call upon him. All right? So there's the gospel. Now, notice it said, go back to Romans uh, chapter 1. Notice it said, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. Let's say a, thing, I'll say a couple things here about power, or really one big thing here about power. Look at Romans 1, should be a familiar verse to you. Look at verse 16. Again, this is Paul. Paul knew a, th a thing or two about the gospel and how to preach it, didn't he? Sure did. Look at verse 16, Romans 1, 16. Look what he says here. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the, what's it say, folks? It is the power of God unto salvation. I love this little next thing it says here. To everyone. Folks that are Calvinists would disagree with that verse, wouldn't they? Who did Jesus Christ die for, folks? Calvinists have this thing called limited atonement that they believe on. They don't think that Jesus Christ died for everybody. Folks, that verse right there says salvation is to everyone that believeth. Amen to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That verse right there tells you that the gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful. How powerful? Powerful enough to save anybody. And anybody who will realize they are a sinner and what they deserve is hell, but Christ died for them, rose again, and gives them eternal life. They'll just simply believe on him and call on him. Folks, do you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ has power? How come you're not preaching it then? Maybe you are, but you know, I look at my own self and I think I could preach it a whole lot more. If the gospel is powerful enough to change lives, then we ought to be proclaiming it. Maybe we really don't think about how powerful it is and that's what's keeping us from proclaiming it. Folks, the verse says right there, I didn't say it, God said it. The verse says that it is the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. People are not going to get saved unless they have the gospel preached to them first. They got to hear it first. Romans 10, 17, we were over there, but I didn't read the verse. Faith cometh by hearing. People got to hear it first and hearing by the word of God. Hey, we got a free country, don't we? It still is. We have an opportunity to preach the gospel. We have an opportunity to give something to people that Alcoholics Anonymous can't give them. No medication can give them. No 12-step program anywhere can give them. Only the Lord God Almighty can give them. Does the gospel have the power to change lives? Then we ought to be preaching it so that lives can be changed. Now, God does the work, but he uses us to preach it so that the work can get done. Amen? All right, so... Notice it said, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. Where's the Holy Ghost if you're saved? In you. And then it said, last thing here, I'll spend some time on that thing about the Holy Ghost, but I'll say it for another time. It said in much assurance. Go to 1 John chapter 3 on this thing about assurance. Now, I don't, I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but uh, I would guess that there's folks among us, 1 John chapter 3, I would guess there's folks among us who maybe at some point in your life, especially if you've been saved for a while, maybe there was a time where you doubted your salvation. Me personally, I think that this is something that is quite normal. And I'm going to tell you why. There's been times in my past where I doubted I was saved. I'm going to tell you more about that in a minute. But look at 1 John chapter 3 and look at verse 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall, what's that next word? Assure, and shall assure our hearts before him. Watch verse 20. For if our heart condemn us, let me stop right there. If you've struggled with assurance of salvation, your heart condemned you. 
Okay, and, and maybe you got to a place where you thought, man, am I really saved? And you had to think through all the whole thing, all right? But look at what the rest of the verse says. If our heart condemn us, verse 20, God is what? Greater than our heart and knoweth what? You know there's some things that God knows that you don't even know. In fact, if you forgot about when you called on Jesus Christ to save you, the Lord remembered. And maybe you forgot a lot of things about your growth and uh, some things in your Christian life. The Lord remembers. So if you've ever, I'm going to give you the real short on this, the real short version of this. If you've ever struggled with your salvation, you know what it comes down to? Because I've been there, done that. Here's what it comes down to. If you struggle with your assurance of salvation, it comes down to, do you believe what God said? That's the bottom line on this. Do you really believe? What did Romans 10, 13 say? For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if you did that, there is no question you are saved because the Bible says so. But I don't feel like it. Did you call on Jesus Christ to save you? And I've had to go, there was a time where I really struggled with this for a while in my life. And I had to think back to when I was a little boy and I did that. I did it. If you did that, it doesn't matter what you think or what your heart tells you. What does the Bible say? If you called on Jesus Christ, knowing that he died for your sins, was buried and rose again. If you did that, what did God do? He saved you. You have his word on it. It doesn't matter what your feelings tell you. You know, feelings are extremely misleading. Did you know that? I tell you, when I was sick, uh, I won't give you all the details. When I got sick, I was messed up for a couple days. Sherry would tell you, oh, yes. I was messed up, and I think that that virus just kind of messes with you mentally. I was talking to Paul about it. It just kind of messes with you. And, and I was not thinking right. And I had to go back to my Bible and get my thinking right. You know, it always, the Bible always straighten out your thinking. It always will. And a lot of times we expect to open up our Bible and in five minutes we'll be straightened out. You may need to spend about 30, 40, 50. You may need to spend an hour in your Bible sometimes. You know what the, the Lord is doing when you spend time in his word? He's cleaning you out. You know what he's doing? He's washing your brain. Because your brain's dirty. See, your brain's dirty from all the nonsense this world's been telling you. God's word has the ability to clean you out. All right? So if you struggle with assurance of salvation, you need to get your nose in God's word and don't stop there. Believe what you're reading and God will straighten you out. He'll give you that assurance, all right? So there's that first, there's that first point there about the word of God coming to you. All right, go back there to 1 Thessalonians. If the word of God came to you and you're saved and you called on Jesus Christ to save you, doesn't matter how long ago that was, according to the word of God, he saved you. Is that something to, be, to, to rejoice about, folks? I hope that if you are ever in a place where you're thinking about all the things that you're thankful for in your life, I hope the first thing that comes to your mind is, I'm saved. Shouldn't that be the first thing? Isn't that the most important thing? All right? Back there in 1 Thessalonians. Notice he says there, in verse 5, how the word of God came unto them in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. And then go to verse 6 there. He says, and ye became followers of us. And of the Lord, now watch this right here. He says, having received the word in much what? Affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. There's that whole thing, and I'm not going to take a lot of time on this here, but there's that thing about God using times of affliction so that you can grow spiritually. And you know what spiritual growth should result in? It says that at the end of verse 6, with joy of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to give you a physical example of this that I experienced this morning. It's really neat. I went out in my garage where I have some equipment to work out with, and I worked out vigorously for about, I think it was about 18 minutes this morning. I think it was 18, 19 minutes. Vigorous workout. I mean, I'm doing all the, the stuff that I get, the heart rate was up there. It wasn't going real heavy, just going intense for about 18 and a half minutes. And I got done with that 18 and a half minutes. I afflicted my body for that 18 and a half minutes. And I'm trying to get my breath there. I waited a couple minutes there, walking around, just kind of getting everything back, trying to get myself back to normal there. And there's these things physically called endorphins. And endor endorphins are a little, little physiology lesson here. Endorphins are happy hormones. Did you know that? And endorphins come about when you vigorously exercise. 
Now, hold on a second. I did not enjoy the affliction I was going through for that 18 and a half minutes. In fact, I said, I'm stopping. And then I was like, no, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to get through this. I had a little routine in my mind. I'm going to finish it. And I got through it. And you know what came out at the end? Now, this is a little in a physical sense, some joy. Folks, you know spiritually how God works. He'll put you through some tough times. But if you'll trust him and endure the tough times, you know what's at the end of that tough time? The joy of the Holy Ghost. I think it, well, probably everybody here can testify of the last several months with this craziness we've had in our world. There's been some times where there's been some affliction. But what came out of it? Hopefully you can say joy came out of that. All right? So when things get tough in the week ahead, and they probably will, maybe not this week, it'll probably be next week, if not this week, realize God's in charge, he's allowing it, and affliction is good for me and you, because what's going to be the result of that? You're going to be able to rejoice at the end of that thing saying, God got me through it. That's the joy of the Holy Ghost right there, all right? Go on there in verse 7. I'm not going to spend time on this, but uh, I just want to read this verse. Verse 7, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Folks, did you know that once you get saved, God wants you to be a testimony. He wants, you to, he wants your life to preach to other people. And what you have there in verse 7 is Paul's bragging on these people. He said, man, you, you folks got saved, and now other people know about you, and they're getting saved as well. So let's go on to the next point. Brandon, I think you'll like this next point. Look at verse 8. For from you, what's that next word? Now he's bragging on these people and he said, the gospel came unto you and then as a result of it coming unto you, the gospel was sounded out from you. Look what he says here. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Did you know that the word of God has sounded out from this church to places all over the world? Did you know that? It's pretty neat how people can get on the internet. You can say what you want about it. I know there's all kinds of crazy and wicked stuff with the internet, but here's something good. People around the world can hear God's word sounded out from Heritage Baptist Church in Titusville on the other side of the earth through the internet. Isn't that cool? Oh, Daniel, uh, our friend in the Netherlands, way over on the other side, not quite on the other side of the world, but a long ways away from here, he can get on online and hear what's going on right here, right now. Isn't that neat? And we've had people, Brother Bob can tell you, there's people logged on to listen to the, to the uh, preaching here from all over the world, different places. So you know what's happening here in our church? And it's the work of God. This is all the Lord. God's word is sounding out from here and going all over the place so that people know there's something going on right here in Titusville. Amen to that? All right, so sounding out. Now, uh, Sherry teaches sixth grade, and uh, she doesn't spend as much time on this as the elementary teachers do, but uh, the crowd I got right here, I think probably most, if not all of you, when you were in first and second grade, you learned how to read thanks to phonics. Phonics, here's phonics. You sound out the word. You sound it out based on the letters so that you can form the word and the purpose of you doing that is so you can say the word properly and clearly. And I think that goes along with what the Bible says right here. From, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. You know how you wanna sound out the word of the Lord? Properly and clearly. It's sad to me that we have a lot of kids in schools all over our country that are 16, 17, 18 years old and their reading level is first and second grade. I think that's sad. I'm gonna tell you why it's sad. I'm not even gonna blast the public school system. I'm just gonna say this. It's sad because God wants you to be able to read. So first and foremost, you can read the most important book, the Bible. The purpose of learning how to read is so that you can read this book. I mean, there's other things you can read also, but this is the most important. And I think about kids that don't know how to read, they can't read the Bible. So they're gonna have a hard time understanding something if you can't read it. So I, I say that because being able to read, if you, have, if you were taught how to read uh, back when you were in elementary school, praise God. 
that you have the ability to open up God's book and read it and understand it. That's another, another sermon there. I think that's neat, though. Now, here's what I did this morning. I uh, looked at that word sound. And the first time I've, I, I found the word sound in the Bible was in Exodus. Go back there. I think this will give us some insight. If Paul said the people of Thessalonica, God's word sounded out from them, I think that God's, God's word needs to be sounded out in every church. So let's see what that might mean. So, uh, Exodus 19, look at verse 12. This is right before uh, Moses. He's getting instructions here about going up to meet the Lord and get the Ten Commandments. And look what happens here, Exodus 19, 12. Lord giving some instruction here. He says, and thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it, Whosoever, whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. Now watch verse 13, you'll find our word. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the, what is it? When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. That's the first time any sound in your Bible is mentioned, and it's the sound of a what? Trumpet. You know how God's word should go forth? Like a trumpet. Let me show you that. Go to Isaiah 58. Look at this. This is neat. Isaiah 58. Now, if you ever hear a trumpet, if you ever hear the sound of a trumpet, you know exactly what's being played. If you couldn't see the person playing the trumpet, you just heard the sound, you would say, I know that's a trumpet. It's got a distinct, clear sound, and it's not a quiet sound, is it? You can't play the trumpet quietly. Uh, there's a church I've been to uh, where they have uh, trumpets and uh, a, a few of those, uh, they got some horns and a couple of trumpets and some other instruments. And you know what happened? They had the trumpets playing when the hymns are being sung and the trumpets are so loud, you gotta sing really loud so that you can even hear yourself sing. I think that's good. The trumpet's loud and it makes everybody sing a little louder, amen? Need some trumpets in here, maybe, huh? Psalm 50, or, uh, Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. Take a look at this. Look at what the Lord says here. He says, he's given some instruction here. He says, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Folks, God's word is to be sounded out just like a trumpet. That means it should be sounded out clearly, and sometimes, people don't like this, but sometimes it ought to be loud. And you know, whenever I read God's word and I raise my voice to, to say certain things, I do that for emphasis sake, to draw your attention to something that God said. And I think that's good that we pay attention to things that God said. So God's word sounding out. Now watch this one. Go to Luke chapter one. This is a neat one. This thing on sounding out God's word. God's word should be sounded out. Go to Luke chapter 1. If you're saved, God's word came unto you, and God's word should sound out from you. Go to Luke chapter 1. This one's neat. goes along with the time of year we're in. Uh, celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. Take a look at this. Look at uh, Luke 1, 39. Luke 1, 39. This is neat. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Okay, so at this point, at this point, you understand that Elizabeth, it, she knows she's going to have a child, all right? And then Mary is going to have a child, also the Lord Jesus Christ. So look at verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. All Mary did was salute Elizabeth, and what's going on? That baby within Elizabeth, who's John the Baptist, boom, he jumps. He kicks or leaps. He does, it says he leaps there, so I'm going to say he leaped. He moved, and he moved in a probably an excited type fashion. And you say, why did that happen? Take a look at verse 42. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, now this is uh, Elizabeth talking, blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. 
And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Look at 44. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Did you catch it? As soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. All Mary said was a salutation. She greeted Elizabeth and that baby leaped in her womb. I say that because words have power and these are the words of the one that was going to give birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that baby, now don't you, we can really get off on this. Don't you, doesn't it make you mad these people who say that there's no life in the womb? Mm, and they think abortion is okay. That baby heard something on the outside. That baby in the womb heard words spoken on the outside and responded. That's life. One characteristic of living things is they respond to stimuli in the environment. That baby's inside the womb and hears something on the outside and responds. Isn't that neat? So I say that because words are powerful. And in this case, the words had enough power to stir up a baby in the womb. And then did you notice there also that um, she says there in verse 44, as soon as thy voice, thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb. How come? For joy. Folks, when God's word is sounded forth, if you're saved and you hear God's word sounded forth, you know what it ought to bring to you? Some joy. Now you came this morning and you knew there was going to be preaching. So hopefully you came with the anticipation of, I'm going to be joyful when I leave here today because I'm going to hear from the Lord. Amen? Joy to the world. We sang it this morning. There's good news in this book, and the purpose of that good news is to give you joy when you hear that good news. Amen? All right. Go back there to 1 Thessalonians. Let's get this last point here. Here's an exciting point. We got the Word of God coming unto you, and then the Word of God being sounded out from you, the gospel, the, uh, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now watch this last thing here. Watch this last thing in 1 Thessalonians 1. Look down there at verse 10. If the word of God has come to you and you got saved and it should be sounding forth from you so that other people can get saved, look what happens when you have uh, communion with brethren, uh, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. The both of you should be engaging in another activity together. Look at this. Look at verse 10. And to, what's that next word? Wait. And to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. All right, if, if uh, let's, let's just say, I don't know this, but you know. Let's say everybody here this morning is saved. You know what we all should be doing together? Waiting. And I have a hard time being patient with this waiting. But we're supposed to wait. And you say, what are we supposed to wait for? Did you catch it in verse 10? We're supposed to wait for the Lord Jesus Christ from where? From heaven, behold, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and they which are alive and remain, I hope I'm part of that group. I'd rather be alive and meet the Lord in the air than die first, but either, both of them have their benefits, right? If you're saved and you're alive, when the Lord appears in the clouds, you're going to meet him up there. And he's going to deliver us from what happens here on earth after that time. You know what it is? It's right there in verse 10. Verse 10 is a great verse to prove pre-tribulation rapture. Notice it says there, we're waiting for his son from heaven, uh, Jesus, which delivered us from what? The wrath to come. You know, wrath is coming to this earth. If you've been studying with us in Revelation, we've been talking about that here recently. The tribulation is God's wrath here on this earth. If you're saved, that verse gives me proof. I'm delivered from the wrath to come here on this earth during tribulation. How am I going to be delivered from it? I'm going to meet the Lord in the air. You don't believe me, do you? Some of you don't believe me. I didn't get very much on amen there. Go to, verse, go to chapter 4. Let's show you this. We're, we're almost done here. Go to chapter 4. Now, if you hadn't had any joy as a result of the message yet, this ought to give you some joy. Look at verse uh, 16. I'll show this to you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. You mean something's going to sound forth? 
The sound of a trumpet, isn't that something right there? The trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain. Now notice that in that wording right there. Let's stop for a second here in verse 17. Then we, who's the author of 1 Thessalonians? I already told you. It's Paul. He's writing to the people in Thessalonica. He's saying, you and me, we, we which, what's that word after which? Are alive and remain. Did you know in the first century when Paul wrote this, he expected the rapture way back then. He said, we which are alive. He expected to be alive when Jesus Christ appeared in the clouds to get the church out of this world. Isn't that something? 1900 years ago, he was expecting it to happen. Folks, I've only been alive 48 years, been saved a little over 40 of those years. I've been waiting for a while. Oh, Apostle Paul is now up there. And I don't know if he does this, but it'd be kind of interesting if he did. I wonder if he asked the Lord, hey, is it now? Is it now? Is it time yet? Is it time? You know? Paul is going to think about this. Can you imagine the great reunion in heaven at the rapture? We're going to meet all the people that we've read about through church history, including Paul and Peter and John. We're going to meet all of them up there. What a reunion. We're going to be able to talk to all those people. And the most important person we're going to be able to talk to is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. What a reunion that's going to be. I mean, all these people from all this time. I mean, Moses will be up there, right? I mean, Elijah will be up there. Man, what a reunion that's going to be. And it's going to happen. Paul was looking for it 1,900 years ago. That means you and I ought to be looking for it not down the road, today. Think about this. All the things that have transpired in the last 1,900 years when it comes to history. And I have this notion, and this is wrong. I'm going to tell you something I, I, I get in my mind. i got to get it out. I have this notion, well, first off, for the rapture to happen, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. So we're probably at least a few months and maybe a few years off. I oftentimes get that in my head, and i got to say, no! We saw the world turned upside down in the last eight months, didn't we? The Lord can turn things upside down in an hour, in 30 minutes, and things can come to pass that we didn't see coming, and boop, 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 boop there it is a trumpet. There's a sound, there's the voice of the archangel, and here we go, amen? But in the meantime, we're waiting. And in the meantime, you know what we ought to be doing? Sounding out the word of the Lord so that people can get on, get in on the same thing that you did, getting saved. And then after that, growing. And then after that, waiting and looking for the Lord to return. Isn't that something right there? There's a whole lot in that passage in 1 Thessalonians 1 I did not hit this morning. Uh, but I'll just ask you this here in closing. The gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful. Did it come unto you and did you receive it? If you did and you called on Jesus Christ to save you, nobody can take salvation away from you. Amen? You ought to rejoice in that this morning. Now, if you're saved, God left you here with a job to do. And that job is to sound forth his words you know, I look around the room here. God's put everybody here in different places. Sherry and I work at the same place, but actually she's in a room all day that I'm not in there maybe for a few minutes at a time. And she's talking to people that I don't talk to during the day. And then I'm talking to people she doesn't talk to during the day. God's put us all right here in different places. You know what purpose? You know what the purpose of him all putting us all in different places is? Wherever he put us, sound forth the word of the Lord. Ought to be happening. And not just where you work. I'm thinking about where we work. How about where we live? Same thing ought to be happening there, right? Sound forth the word of the Lord. Now you say, I hadn't been doing that. I'll tell you what's very effective. Ask God to give you opportunities where you work, where you live, wherever you are, to talk to people about the Lord Jesus Christ so you can sound forth the word of the Lord. All right? Ask God to give you those opportunities. Last thing. Are you waiting for Christmas to come? Or are you waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to come? As a kid, as a kid, I would impatiently count the days because I knew I was going to get all these presents on December the 25th, and I would impatiently wait. Folks, you know what we ought to be looking for way more than December 25th. 
We ought to be looking for the Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds. I'm telling you, you ought to do this. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. You ought to go outside for a few minutes every day and just go like this. Is it going to be in the east or the west? I don't know. But he's coming, and he's coming in the clouds. And ought to be waiting and ought to be ready to meet him. Because you know what comes right after the rapture, folks? The judgment seat of Christ. And saved folks are not judged whether they go to heaven or hell. You're judged according to what you did or did not do for the Lord Jesus Christ. So while we're waiting, let's sound forth God's word. While we're waiting, let's live for him and be an example to people around us. While we're waiting, this is a big one. Let's just do right in the sight of God, no matter what this world does. Just keep doing right. All right, let's pray together this morning. Lord, I want to thank you so much for just the opportunity we got to preach what a thing to have these words in front of us that are powerful because the Holy Ghost is uh, giving them the power. And I pray this morning you just raise up folks. I know I, I certainly needed to hear the message about uh, being a, a testimony and consistently sounding out your words and also just waiting on you. And I pray that all of us, this is the work that we would be engaged in in the week ahead. I just pray you'd really do a work in our hearts right now. And may we uh, get some things right with you if that, need, if that be the case. Uh, may we make some commitments to you if that be the case with folks and uh, may we just go out of here edified and ready to uh, live this Christian life that you put us here to live. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.